Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our second Learn From Home live session. My name is Rose, and I am the marketing and PR person here at Ocean Sonics. For those of you who joined us last week, you'll know that we regularly hold staff learning sessions at our office where our teammates share their expertise with the rest of our crew. Now, because many of us, not just Ocean Sonics, are working from home, we wanted to share our learning sessions with you. We'll be doing these live sessions regularly, so keep your eyes on our social media channels. We are going to share all the details, such as upcoming topics and sessions on our social feeds. So last week, Emma gave a great presentation on waterfall displays and FFTs, and if you miss a session, don't worry. We did record it, and it now lives on our YouTube channel, so you can visit it and revisit it anytime you'd like. Today's session is also going to be recorded and shared online, so don't worry if you miss something or if you'd like to watch it again. So for everyone joining us today who is unfamiliar with Ocean Sonics, we are an ocean acoustics company. We're based in Truro, Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada, and we created the IC Listen. It's a real-time smart hydrophone, and this is a tool that is used to collect ocean sound data, and what makes it really special is that this hydrophone processes that data in real time so you can actively listen while the sensor is deployed. So on to today's topic, we will be discussing ocean observatories, and Jillian will be leading today's session. Hi, Jillian. <laughs> so this past December, Jillian and I held a workshop at the World Marine Mammal Conference on real-time detection, classifying, localization, and tracking of marine mammals. And part of this workshop focused on ocean observatories. And these are great tools for learning more about marine species and overall marine environments. Because ocean observatories are more than one singular sensor, such as hydrophones, they provide a really robust picture of what's happening in an environment. So Jillian is going to take the lead on today's topic. She joined Ocean Sonics in 2017 as our staff biologist, and she's the resident marine mammal expert. She's also a trained passive acoustic monitoring, or PAM, system operator. So hi, Jillian. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So Jillian, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you're going to talk about today? Yeah, uh, so today I'll be teaching you all about ocean observatories. Um, and if you know nothing, don't worry, because I'll be starting from the beginning of what is, an, what is an ocean observatory. And if you already know about ocean observatories, I'm hoping that we can dig a bit deeper and um, I can introduce you to some new topics or some maybe some more data that you can look at and some observatories that you can check out. So um, first I'll be looking at some large observatories uh, with multiple nodes and arrays, and then we'll be moving on to some slightly, but no less impressive mm -hmm. observatories, uh, just a little bit smaller. Um, and finally, I'm going to do uh, an acoustic network that we set up and tested in British Columbia, the whale tracking network. Um, using the ISOs and hydrophones and equipment from Ocean Sonics. Jillian, that sounds fantastic. So after the finish your presentation, we are going to have a Q&A session. So some of you have already sent in a couple questions for Jillian. If you want to know some more detail about what we covered today, you can just leave us a comment on our live stream. I will be monitoring it throughout this presentation, so I'll be collecting all your questions. So if you see something you want to know more about, or if uh, something really tickles your fancy, leave us a comment and we'll get to it after Jillian is finished with her presentation. So let's hop right into it then, shall we? Great. Okay. All right, fantastic. Take it away, Jillian. Great, thank you. Okay, so today, as I mentioned, I'll be talking about acoustic monitoring, um, ocean observatories, and acoustic networks. And I'll be using this little laser pointer um, to point out anything that I might find interesting on the screen. <laughs> uh, so first off, I'm going to talk about what is an ocean observatory. Uh, the next, I'm going to mention a few large ocean observatories and go into a little bit more detail on what they are and what they do. Um, and the next is the smaller observatories and acoustic networks. So jumping right into it. 
the first, uh, so what is an ocean observatory? Uh, it is an underwater platform with a variety of sensors that sample different parts of the environment. Um, and these different parts could be the physical, chemical, geological, and biological. Uh, and they can take measurements on the temperature, the salinity, uh, ocean currents, and they can also help detect earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, um, the weather, uh, ships, and marine mammals, uh, such as this little dude over here. And uh, these usually are set up as permanent observatories and they create long-term data collection. Uh, so if you're thinking, what does this look like? What could an ocean observatory be? Um, here is a, an example from the OOI, uh, which is the Ocean Observatories Initiative. Um, and it's showing a very large array um, that is an ocean observatory. And so this is actually on a slope here and there's different types of sensors. Um, so there's some moorings, um, a surface mooring, and this is all cabled, as you can see here, um, with this uh, white line through here. And these uh, little nodes, so these ones that are in red, um, they're the primary nodes, and there's also different types of nodes for the different sensors. So these are like a big junction box that would control the power and the communications to each of the instruments. So that's important when it's all cabled back to shore. So these observatories can transmit data in real time or near real time. And what I'm gonna be focusing a bit more on today is the acoustic side of it. So they have many different sensors um, and one of them is usually a broadband hydrophone such as our IC Listen HF. And this measures from 10 Hertz to 200 kilohertz. Um, and this allows real-time monitoring and localization of marine mammals. Um, it can record continuously over broadband bandwidths, and uh, there's no restriction on the data storage, data access, or the power supply. Um, and the data can be used to study the sound in the ocean environment. And this uh, is really important because it allows researchers to be able to report data immediately, so as soon as it comes back to the shore station, but it also allows people to create long-term measurements and observations over these longer data sets that they collect. Um, so the first one I'm going to be talking about is the cabled observatories, and these are not limited by the power in the high data transmission that might um, happen to some other types of observatories that aren't cabled. Um, this allows for the real-time data, and it allows uh, information on marine mammals for both science and mitigation applications, and improves the efficiency of localizing marine mammals, because if we can hear them um, and we are getting the real-time or near real-time data, we can report um, quite fast on <laughs> where they actually are. And it helps mitigate sensitive areas and avoid harmful interactions. So over these longer term data sets, we can actually see when these marine mammals are in the environment, when we're detecting them, and when they're going away. Uh, so cabled observatories aren't suited for every area, um, especially ones with significant disturbance. So if there's areas where there's a high tidal flow um, and there's a lot of sediment movement, um, that's not great for the cables. Also, if the area is highly trafficked, so if there's a lot of vessels in the area, um, that can be dangerous, as well as heavily fished areas and trawling, um, where uh, it might risk actually taking out some of the equipment that's placed on the seafloor. So as I said, um, so alternatively to these cable platforms, there's also other types of platforms in these observatories. And these can include gliders, um, AUVs, so autonomous underwater vehicles, um, the surface movies, and profilers. And there's also alternative data transmission. So if not all the data is getting back through the cables, how are they getting this data? And one way uh, that 
you can use is satellite, uh, such as Iridium. Uh, you can also use uh, radio transmission and Wi-Fi, uh, depending on how close or far away your equipment is from shore. So if your equipment is really far away from shore, you're going to be using something like satellite if it's in a remote location. Next, I'm going to move on to the large ocean observatories. And the first one I'm going to talk about is Ocean Observatories Initiative, OOI. And this is located in the Americas. Um, and it's, the, it's funded by the National Science Foundation uh, with the collaboration from HUI and the University of Washington. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Uh, the next one I'm going to talk about is the Ocean Networks Canada, Neptune, the Neptune Observatory, and that's located on the west coast of Canada. And I just wanted to mention some other large observatories, uh, the Integrated Marine Observing System, IMOS in Australia, and the European Global Ocean Observing, S Observing System, uh, Eurogoos, <laughs> in, uh, for the future of Europe. Uh, and so I'm going to start off with the Ocean Observatories Initiative, OOI. And here's a photo of it over here um, of all the arrays that it actually has right now. Um, and this integrates globally distributed marine observations into one system. It allows the data to be freely downloaded over the internet in real time. And as I said before, it was, it's funded by the National Science Foundation uh, with collaborations from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, as well as University of Washington, Oregon State University, and Rutgers University in New Jersey. Um, and as you can see here, there are actually seven arrays and they're located all around North and South America. So yes, yeah, seven arrays, and there's over 800 instruments deployed currently. And uh, right here, we can see a picture of uh, a few things right here. It's a hydrophone mass uh, being lifted into position atop a junction box at the slope base site of the OOI. And if you can't tell, right here is the hydrophone, and this is actually the hydrophone, <laughs> the isolation. Uh, SC-35. Um, right beside it is an ADCP, which is an acoustic Doppler current profiler. And here's another photo from the OOI, and it's showing the ROV Ropos uh, lifting the protective cap off of an IC Listen broadband hydrophone tripod display, displayed at or deployed at the Endurance offshore location, which is actually 600 meters depth. Um, so this is a little tripod and they're actually removing this protective cap that would go on top of it um, for deployment so it wouldn't get injured, <laughs> wouldn't uh, take off an element or anything like that while it was being deployed. Okay, so next I'm going to talk a little bit about Ocean Networks Canada. And this is from the University of Victoria in British Columbia. And it services the west, east, and Arctic regions of Canada. So you can see here uh, all of their installations existing and permanent and future. Um, yeah, so you can look at this right here. And this continuously delivers data in real time for scientific, scientific research as well. And they have 400 instruments and over 5,000 sensors um, that have been deployed. And they, uh, their goal is evidence-based decision-making, um, including ocean management, disaster mitigation, and environmental protection. And this is the one I'm going to be talking a little bit about, is this Neptune Observatory over here. Here is the Neptune Observatory, and um, this is right off of British Columbia in Canada. Uh, the submarine cables uh, that are in this observatory are designed to handle the harsh conditions of the ocean environment. Uh, and that includes temperatures, pressure increases, and currents that can all occur throughout this whole site. 
Um, there's hazardous geological features, as well as human activities such as fishing. Um, uh, the Ocean Networks Canada has a portal system that you can use so that anybody can actually access all of this data that it's collecting um, around uh, its different observatories. And uh, they have a smart ocean systems. They have over 500 terabytes stored currently in their sh shore stations. And they collect around 280 gigabytes per day. And as I said, this is open to all researchers and the public, and they encourage people to go on um, their portals and actually look at this data and use this data. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the different types of equipment that Ocean Networks Canada um, uses and that they um, talk about on their website. So the first one is extension cables. Um, and they use fiber optic cables. And so this uh, transfers the data from the instruments to the shore in near real time over long distances. They also have hybrid cables, and these include both optical fibers to carry information and electrical conductors to transmit power. And finally, they have these backbone cables. And these are the major transmission lines. Um, the Neptune Observatory has an 800 kilometer backbone cable loop, which is crazy. <laughs> um, so that information can travel in both directions and ensures that the data will continue to flow to shore even if one section of the backbone cable loop is damaged. So if it's cut in the middle, both of the sides of all the sensors and all the data can still continue going to shore. Um, also to mention that there are repeaters and these are called optical amplifiers with fiber optics. Um, and they're used at regular intervals to prevent optical signal from degrading. And so that prevents um, the communication from being um, degrading or from losing communication to these instruments and the data transferred back to shore. Okay, some of the connector types that they use on these, uh, on these arrays. Um, so when you're connecting a connector to either a cable or a junction box or uh, from anything really, uh, you need to actually mate these connectors. Um, so you need this connection. Uh, the first one I'm gonna talk about is the electrical dry mate connector. And these must be connected in air and with the mating interfaces dry and sealed from the external environment. Uh, so you want to do this uh, before you go out into the field. You want to make sure that everything has the connection um, in a safe, sealed environment. Uh, the next one, an underwater mateable connector. And these can be connected underwater with the use of an ROV. So they actually have protection um, from the electrical and optical components uh, from the surrounding seawater. And this adds modularity to the observatories. So they're actually able to disconnect and reconnect these different types of sensors or nodes underwater. And the last one is a wet mate. And it's kind of in between the dry mate and the underwater mateable connectors. Um, you can safely connect them on the deck of a ship or in the elements. And it's nicknamed the splash mate. So it can be splashed but it cannot be mated underwater. And finally, I'm gonna talk about some smaller scale observatories and acoustic networks. Uh, so the first one, um, MARS, the Monterey Accelerated Research System from MBARI, the Monterey Bay Research Initiative Observatory. Aloha, Cabled Observatory in Hawaii. Uh, there is an observatory in Antarctica called the McMurdo Oceanographic Observatory, MOO. Um, there's also Cornell Bioacoustics North Atlantic Right Whale Monitoring Buoys. Uh, there's Orca Lab studying northern resident killer whales in BC. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the whale tracking network um, from DFO in BC. Also in BC, there's Echo and uh, DFO drifters in the St. Lawrence. So first, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Mars Observatory. And Mars provides electrical power and data connections for new research instruments in the deep sea. 
And here is uh, one of their uh, nodes right here um, that's connecting uh, by cables all of these different sensors and uh, different instruments that are around the node. And here's actually a picture from their observatory that has uh, one of our IC listens um, further away from the node that's cabled to the node. And they produce 24 terabytes of acoustic data each year. Um, and this is a long-term and real-time experiment, uh, 891 meters below the surface of the Monterey Bay. The main Mars node, the orange box, uh, connects to the shore through a 52 kilometer long uh, power and fiber optic cable. And Mars serves as an engineering, science, and education test bed for even larger regional ocean observatories. And there's a live stream. Uh, so they actually stream the data from their acoustic uh, instruments to this soundscape listening room. And so you can actually go on there and listen to the sounds of the Monterey Bay 24 seven, <laughs> um, whenever your heart desires. And they also, if there's nothing happening or if there's a large ship going by, um, they do have some samples of all the different marine mammals that are in that area that you can listen to as well. And finally, I'm gonna talk about the whale tracking network, which uses the Oceansonics ICLS and hydrophones. Um, so this is a marine mammal tracking um, that's using multiple hydrophones in a large scale cabled array. And this was to track and localize orcas, uh, the Southern resident killer whales in real time. And this had multiple hydrophones of so 28 deployed and strategic nodes, and there were nine of them, <laughs> to listen to uh, the Southern resident killer whales in real time. And this is to assist in preventing vessel strikes, uh, help monitor and regulate vessel speed, improve understanding of the SRKW movement, and testing the ability of monitoring and tracking the whales in real time to see the advantages and limitations of the instruments. So this is pretty much an overview of the entire project. Um, here is where we set up the different nodes along BC, uh, the Southern Salish Sea, um, right around here. And this is pretty much how each node was set up. Um, there were three, two, two, four hydrophones per node, and they were all cabled to an IC link. And this is a junction hub, kind of like the nodes that are in the observatories, that controls the power that's going to the hydrophones as well as the communication to and from the hydrophones. Um, and then it also regulates everything that's going back to shore through this cable. And everything goes back to this HCI, the hub. And this is what sends out the data, regulates the data, and can also um, keep uh, the data here on a data um, drive, <laughs> a hard drive. Um, it can also have GPS, uh, so it has a time synchronization uh, for all of the hydrophones to have the proper time synchronization, which is very important when you're localizing on hydrophones. And the HCI also has the ability to connect to either um, through Ethernet to the internet or to a radio. And this radio can send the data from these HCIs all to a central radio um, that has a server. And at this server, all it takes in all the data from all of these hydrophones and it can store the data here and put it up onto the internet where we are able to access that data remotely. So you're able to access it from Nova Scotia um, when all the data was. So all the data was sent to shore for processing. Um, there was one site for storing data and the computer for storing data and processing. Uh, the data was accessed remotely and there was real time data streamed from the site to the web browser. Um, that allowed us to do detections of orcas, shipping noise, and chain noise, and the ability to stream and listen to the data in real time and see the tracking of these whales. Um, and here is us setting up the whale tracking network. Here's me. And uh, here are some of the resources that I used uh, to put this slideshow together. Um, the first one is DOSITS, so 
great resource for any um, underwater acoustics uh, mm -hmm. that you want to look at, as well as the next one down, which is the oceanobservatories.org, and that's the OOI, so the Ocean ah. Observatories Initiative. Um, below that is the oceannetworks.ca, so that's Ocean Networks Canada, and then finally Ambari, um, where it has its cabled observatory. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that, Jillian. Uh, let's hop right into some questions. Uh, just a reminder, if you do have a question for Jillian, you can leave it on any of our social channels. I am monitoring them as we speak. So feel free to ask a question about something you saw today. Um, so uh, let's hop in with a question that we got through our Instagram. What ocean observatories have their data available to the public and where can we find it? Yeah, so as I was mentioning uh, in the presentation, there is the OOI, so the Ocean Observatory Initiative. Um, that has a portal where you can access all of the data online, as well as Ocean Networks Canada, which has a portal, um, so you can also download all of the data there. Um, they also have tutorials on how you can actually download this data and use this data, because it does it's a lot of data and <laughs> huge database, so it does become um, kind of distressing for some people when they're looking at that much information, they can't find what they want. Um, they have tutorials on there that you can actually access um, and use. And uh, also the Mars Observatory has spectrograms from uh, many years of data online as well. Very cool. So if anybody wants to access those, um, I'm going to compile a, a set of the, the links and various ocean observatories, and I will put it in the show notes um, or the video notes on our YouTube channel, as well as share them on our Facebook page. So um, don't worry if you didn't catch all that. We will compile them and put them together for you. Yeah. Um, and if anybody, oh, sorry. And if anybody has any other uh, resources from ocean observatories, yeah, you can let us know as well. Yeah, we're always looking to learn more as well. So, we do have another question here. Um, someone has asked, can you create a mobile observatory? So I think they mean using like an AUV or a glider and not doing any of those um, seafloor cabling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And uh, they're using uh, these mobile platforms more and more, uh, especially when you can put on more power and uh, use them a little bit better. So. Uh, they can use them uh, exclusively, or you can use them with the observatories that are there that are cabled right now. And uh, pretty much the same way, you just send uh, all your data either through satellite um, or through another means, or they could possibly just record all of their data. And um, when they get the instrument back, then they take off all the data as well. All right, so we have another Instagram question here. What are ocean observatories most used for? And does the use depend on the location? Uh, yeah, so I guess that they are used for a lot of things. And uh, there are different functions and different purposes based on the array. Um, but many of them take similar measurements. So they all uh, would take like temperature, salinity, um, current speeds. Um, and usually they have low frequency hydrophones to track uh, low frequency noises for things like earthquakes and stuff. And also the broadband hydrophones that uh, track things like marine mammals and different things in the area. Um, yeah, so there's uh, definitely different functions for different ones and uh, they can be used for weather alerting systems and um, yeah, creating these research uh, databases. So. All right, so we have a final question here. Um, what other types of sensors and instruments are used in the observatories? Great question. Uh, so as I mentioned there, on one of the slides I had, uh, an, there was an ADCP, which is an acoustic Doppler current profiler, and that measures currents. Um, there are CTDs, so they would be the current, uh, conductivity, temperature, depth, um, that's what they would measure. Um, and there's also CO2 sensors, um, different types of sensors for each thing, but there's also, sometimes there's cameras or sonars that are um, taking pictures. And uh, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of different ones. And you can also go on to 
uh, the Ocean Observatory Initiative, they have a full list of all their sensors that they have on their arrays right now too. So that's very interesting. Cool. Fantastic. I think that um, I think those are all of our questions for now. Um, and again, if you have some more questions that um, arise when you watch this a second time, um, or if there's something that you weren't comfortable asking on the social media channels, you can always drop us a line. Our emails are uh, right there on the screen. Uh, feel free to jot those down if you'd like. Um, so thanks so much, Jillian. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's if there's and also if there's a topic you'd like to see covered during one of our web series, uh, please don't hesitate to contact myself or Jillian. As I mentioned, our emails are there. Feel free to use them. Um, and of course, you can always drop us a line on our social media channels. Um, and if you'd like to revisit this presentation, it will be available on YouTube, as well as a, a, a link shared through our Facebook page. Um, and again, if anybody's interested in visiting the data portals or home pages for these observatories, I am going to post the, the links and the video notes on YouTube, and I'll share them through Facebook as well. Um, so that more or less wraps us up for today. Thanks for joining us, and hopefully we will see you next week. We are going to have Ashley Noseworthy of Edgewise Environmental. She'll be joining us for an in-depth discussion on passive acoustic monitoring and mitigation techniques. So hopefully we will see you then. Cool. Thank and you, everybody. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.